It's Saturday night. It's almost live. And it's right up a big tower in London's Westminster. It's Sam Delaney's News Thing. Joining Sam this week, crisp and fruity and goes well with white meat, it's David Mills. Top notes of blackcurrant and compliments a nice risotto, it's Holly Byrne. And nothing for me, I'm driving, it's Louisa Zisman. Coming up, Jeremy Corbyn, crisis? What crisis? That crisis, you bearded tit! He's rich, he's white, what's not to like? Please welcome the next president of the United States. And here to shoot the breeze, and all men, it's Jermaine Greer. Welcome to the show. Thanks for joining me, panel. Right, there were local elections this week, which was our first chance to see how Jeremy Corbyn's Labour perform at the polls. Did they do badly? Well, put it this way, they finished behind the Tories in Scotland. I didn't even think Tories were allowed into Scotland. <laughs> the only things less popular than the Conservative Party in Scotland are the English and vitamin D. <laughs> what can we say about how Corbyn has fought the government over the past year? Well, nothing really that could explain it any better than this clip. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> He's failed to score in an open goal. This government is the most heartless and radical of modern times. But I tell you what, you can't blame the bastards who voted them in. Blaming Tory voters for being selfish is like blaming Vernon Kay for soliciting sexy texts from pastry models. It's just what they do. The point is, someone, <laughs> someone is supposed to be responsible for the Tories not doing whatever the fuck they like. That's supposed to be Corbyn's job. But he's so distracted with pretending not to be an anti-Semite that he's allowed the government to swan around dismantling the NHS and privatising schools without a buy nor leave. I mean, it's like Tess Daly sitting around debating the true nature of Marxism with Claudia Winkleman while Vernon Kay merrily wanks all over Rianne Sugden's tits in the same fucking room. That's what's happening on your watch, Corbyn. The Tories are wanking over the country's tits right in front of your face and you've not got the balls to make them stop. I tell you what, Tess Daly is twice the man you will ever be. Labour created most of the things that are brilliant about this country. The NHS, the welfare state, the Millennium Dome, Oasis. <laughs> that Catherine Tate sketch where Tony Blair said, am I bothered? <laughs> but now their proud history has been flung into the dirt by one of those bitter old bastards who write really long, angry comments underneath articles on the Guardian website and thinks that qualifies him to run the country. Now, even something like this... <laughs> ..goes completely unnoticed. They're not even pretending not to be lizards anymore. They're rubbing our fucking faces in it. Of course, Jeremy Corbyn boasts about the big mandate he has from the party in the form of all those basket cases who joined for three quid last year for a laugh. But Corbyn's job is not to be cheered on by his own mates. It's to appeal to the whole country. And this week, the country told him he's about as appealing as a shit sandwich. So, panel, why is he still here, Holly Ben? He hasn't done as bad, has he, today, as you thought he was going to do? Third place in Scotland. Look, Scotland, the... Scotland is another country. That's the only headline I'm interested in. I mean, how can you be beaten by Conservatives in fucking Scotland? I mean, who knew there was even more space to lose in Scotland for Labour? You know <laughs> yeah, I mean? exactly. That's crazy. I just think he is such a damp squib. To me, he's like one of these guys who stumbles out of the jungle 30 years after the war, still fighting the war because he's got an old wireless in the jungle. You know, I mean, he's completely <laughs> irrelevant. I just think it is so outrageous, all these metropolitan elites talking about Corbyn, Corbyn, Corbyn. What is supporting Corbyn doing to stop austerity, to help poor people. Yeah. You know, they're gutting public services and Corbyn's standing by. Yeah, absolutely right. Maybe he's a secret Tory. Well, Maybe precisely. Tory. But, Louisa, you, you are a raging Tory, <laughs> so right? And uh, I respect you for that. But tell me, you must be absolutely delighted that the Labour Party have such an incompetent buffoon in charge. I think, I don't know, why, why did they put him in charge, though? It Obviously, was a, it, he was it, the best of a bad bunch. It was a prank by a load of hippies who, who had never been members before, who joined up for a laugh. I um, think it's brilliant. 
Yeah, I'm sure you do. Well, that's all we need to know. It's all about, it's all about PR, though, isn't it? Mm. You don't like him because he doesn't look good. He doesn't do the Blair no, but thing. Also he doesn't present himself mm. in a way, it's, you know... He's also, all of his policies and ideas are really unpopular with the British public. And from, yeah. from 1945. Hang on. Mm. Hang on, no, but the thing is, he's badly PR'd, he's badly presented. No, you can't you PR know. those ideas, the, the public yeah. don't vote some for them. Some of them aren't great, but some of them are, are, are loving and caring, and he wants to, you know... You know, he goes to PMQs, and he reads letters from old ladies who have cats stuck up in the tree. Hey, Do you know what hey, I mean? that's sweet. Who hates him more, Tory MPs or Labour MPs right now? Labour MPs. Labor. I think Labour MPs. MPs. Yeah. Tory MPs must really like him. But yeah. you guys useless. are the problem. You guys are the ones that, are, um, you know, we're, we're giving him all this bad press. What about we? we because he deserves. He doesn't it. do anything. We're not to talking get him about about any. We're not talking what about are the, the successes, Tories. Though? But what are the successes that he's yeah, been able he to? Yeah, He's done better this in this election than we thought he was going to do. Oh, well, that is that, pretty much like. Well, you yeah. know, he's, you sound like my mum when I came in like second to last <laughs> in the sack race. <laughs> he's, you know he's scrambling. He's trying to claw back. Everything that came undone. Yeah, but it came, it's come yeah, but undone worse under it. him. Even no, more. no, no. I mean, you never thought come you on. would miss Ed Miliband. I right? know. Uh, Ed well, Miliband yeah, suddenly looks like Miliband fucking Barack yeah, Obama yeah. by comparison. He has a lot to claw back. Mm. Thank you, panel. OK, <laughs> let me ask you. Should Doctor Who be black? <laughs> Should James Bond be a Sikh? You know, with a big fuck-off turban designed by Q that's magnetic and can undo bras. And should Paddington Bear be a badger? <laughs> if your answer Aww. to any of those is no, then I'm afraid you're a racist. But if your answer to any of those was yes, then you're also wrong. This week, there's been a petition set up for Elsa from Frozen to be made a lesbian in the sequel film Frozen 2 Electric Fruzaloo. <laughs> you won't be surprised this story was in The Guardian, a constant stream of half-hearted stories where someone's angry that someone else isn't a lesbian. And now they're angry that Elsa out of Frozen isn't one. I mean, for God's sake, why? Whatever happened to people making up stories to entertain children and make a shitload of money? The sexuality of these characters is neither here nor there and rarely relevant to the plot, except, of course, in Beauty and the Beast, where, frankly, the sexuality is all over the fucking place. I mean, you've got yeah. humans having it off with animals and, in one bit, a wardrobe fucks a candelabra. <laughs> it's sickening. Look, anyway, I don't need a Disney movie to educate my kids about homosexuality, thank you very much. I did that myself, yes. It was an awkward and excruciating experience for all of us, and I'm pretty sure half of what I said was factually incorrect. But by God, I stepped up to the plate and did my parental duty instead of expecting Simba the Lion or fucking Basil the Great <laughs> Mouse Detective to do my dirty work for me. The thing is with kids, a character's sexuality would barely register with them anyway. They're not good with subtext. I mean... I never picked up on the allegorical warnings about fascism in Watership Down. I just thought it was simply a heartwarming tale about gassing rabbits that had Mixie. So, in the <laughs> words of Elsa, whose sexuality is of no consequence compared to the fact she fucking fires ice out of her hands, let it go. Panel, if we looked to Disney for sex education, we'd all have the hots for dwarves, wouldn't we, with Louisa Sisman? I, I don't mind a dwarf. Actually. Yeah, well, you were the wrong person to go to with that question. <laughs> as soon as it came out of my mouth, I thought, there's a lady who's had experiences with dwarves. In a wardrobe. Yeah. How do we know that Elsa wasn't already a lesbian? Well, precisely. Because in the first movie, she didn't have a love interest, did she? Mm. Her sister did. Mm. Her slaggy sister had two of them, actually. Yeah. But So Elsa Can might already up. be a lesbian. Well, yeah, but this is precisely the point. They said, there's a lot of people who look, said it seems like she might be a lesbian and there was a subtext going on about her sexual struggle. Why does that need to be more explicit in Electric Fruit Saloon? Because in all of these Disney films, the text, not the subtext, is again and again and again heterosexuality. All about the family, all about finding the man, finding the woman, the woman finding the man. Yeah. Let's take the gay subtext and make it the text. Mm. You know, get Tom Daly in there. He's kind of a Disney character already. He looks oh, like one, no. yeah. No, I say, I'm sorry, I hold my hands up, never seen the film. Don't have a clue about it, and I'm not. Get out. Get I out. am not interested in that crap. But I'll tell you something. I know it's about. Is it about two sisters and their yeah. friendship and all this yeah. kind of business? Lovely. Right. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I am all over.
for that kind of thing. I have mm. lots of female friends and we are not lesbians. Mm, yeah. Why so, not? Because... <laughs> <laughs> so they all win in the end, the women, yeah? And she wins off her own back, is this right? Mm. With another woman in turn. They've started introducing that, that the woman does win without winning yeah. a prince. Thank you. Mm. So why does this automatically always have to come back to sex? Why does it automatically always have to come back to relationships and needing somebody else? Why can't it just be independent women doing it for themselves? Oh, yeah. That's Never thought of that, did you? That's Destiny's Child lyrics you're saying now. Yeah. This isn't bloody karaoke. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sometimes you've got to revert to, you know... To, so we all understand what that's about, don't we, Louisa? No, but then people think that they've got to be a lesbian, haven't they? You know, but what's wrong with lesbians? Women. Then people are like, oh, obviously she's a lesbian. It doesn't matter what sexuality you are, surely. It's just about, you're a woman. It's about celebrating womanhood and about being yourself and fighting and, and, and uh, I don't know what the story is. She wins in the end. The point is, the text doesn't need to be about sexual identity whatsoever. Yeah. That's the Not thing. Really yeah, but but if, someone's, if someone's gay, it doesn't mean the text is about sexual identity. Like in the same it way, about... it's not about sexual identity when someone's straight. They just happen to be. No. And you know what? Here's the thing. The kids are way ahead of us on this already. Yeah. They're already out there reading all that slash fiction. To them, <laughs> everyone's gay in their mind anyway. It's just the parents who have an issue with this. News thing's been running for six months. Is it time we now had a gay Sam Delaney? Louisa? Yeah, I'd like that. David? I thought we already had one. Yeah, a lot of people have said that. Holly? Well, you've got your pink tie, your pink yeah. kerchief. What next? This, this, this is a pandering to stereotypes once again, just because I'm wearing pink. Yeah. Fair enough. OK. Yes. Thanks, panel. <laughs> uh, coming up, our special guest, the intellectual who taught me to respect myself as a woman. Yes, it's Jermaine Greer. <laughs> and how America got drunk on Donald Trump's top bats. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> so, it's Trump versus Clinton, a billionaire reality star troll who wants to pull up a drawbridge and start lobbing bombs over the top just for a laugh versus Nanny fucking McPhee. All right, listen, Donald Trump is insane, yes, but let's not forget, America is also insane. It's like they say in the film Demolition Man, sometimes you have to send a maniac to catch a maniac, only in this case, the maniac is a country, and instead of being caught, they're being governed by a maniac. America needs bold, larger-than-life leadership. It's not like Britain, where we're happy to be led by a series of elderly, bookish policy wonks with the occasional middle-aged, charismatic salesman to spice things up. Pretty much every president they've ever had has either been a fucking head case or fucking awesome, or very often both. Look at this. is Swagger, the commander-in-chief of the world's biggest military, in shades, playing the saxophone. He can do Baker Street without breaking a sweat, or he can have you killed. He's a complete package. If you want to get elected in Britain, you've got to appear calm and sober and smart and statesmanlike. If you want to get elected in the States, you've got to come across like sort of bloke who'd be great value on a stag weekend in Estonia. Think about their last few presidents. You can just picture them rocking up at Gatwick's North Terminal on a Friday morning, can't you? <laughs> There'd be Kennedy and Clinton at the bar pushing through from their pre-stag warm-up the night before. You'd have Nixon getting stuck into his duty-free Jamesons, which he's <laughs> refusing to share. Reagan's hoovering up a full English to line the old stomach and Obama's <laughs> down boots picking up Johnny's and Link's. George W. Bush turns up with a load of gack taped near his nutsack, but then shits it just before security <laughs> and does the old bolting in the gents to eat the lot. Brilliant. 30 minutes later, he's on the plane, coked off his nut, sitting next to a child watching Madagascar and laughing his fucking tits off. Meanwhile, Kennedy started laying moves on a pretty young stewardess, but Clinton makes a lewd remark about a Toblerone and blows everyone's chances. Reagan's hopped onto the drinks trolley and he's pushing it down the aisle, shouting, choo-choo! <laughs> it's not just classic bants, it's presidential-level bants. It doesn't get any better. The only bloke who wouldn't fit in is George Bush Sr, of course. He's like the brother-in-law your missus makes you invite along your duty-bound to share a room with a boring bastard. Turns up wearing a fucking neck pillow and moaning about exchange rates. <laughs> and then when you get there, he says something about going to look at a cathedral and with any luck just fucks off for the rest of the weekend. No wonder he didn't get a second term. Anyway, the point is, history tells us that America will always vote for the candidate who seems like the most fun. So who's going to win this time? It's either this candidate... I believe that no. marriage is not just a bond, but a sacred bond between a man and a woman. Or this candidate. Hey! Oh, 
Austin. Austin's done the Donald. What? Stone Cold just what done the Good God Almighty. What, what a WrestleMania. <laughs> Oh, we might as well just call the result right now, right, David Mills? I completely disagree. I think Hillary's good. I mm. think she's going to eat him for breakfast. Mm. They have thrown everything at this woman for the past 25 years, and she's still standing. She beats them hands down every time, and she goes up against the wire, but she comes back, mm. and I think she's going to come back. Well, uh, what do you think? Do you think Donald Trump would get your vote if it was going on here? I, I don't. I would probably vote for him just for shits and giggles, really. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that, yeah, that speaks a lot of the American lot. electorate. And I yeah. think the Americans will do that. But so just here, let's see what he'll be like, this dude. Mm. I would find it interesting to see what he's like. He'd be like more fun than Hillary, wouldn't he? Well, precisely. That's the. Well, point. we Excuse know what me. he's like. Excuse me. I mean, she let her husband get away with being sucked off by that woman. By the like, I mean, experience. how publicly mm. humiliating. Excuse if that me. was me, I would just, cr I just couldn't. And now she's like <laughs> running for president. Yeah. Yes, exactly. exactly. And now she's running for president. So oh, she's, God, she took I a just... fall and now she's come back stronger Absolutely. and better. And Absolutely. who's going who's gonna to be laughing on the other side of her face? Not her. Well, I tell you what, sucking off, you're right to bring it up because, I mean, that will be a huge issue in this election. You've got one woman who let her husband get away with getting sucked off yeah. in the Oval Office by the worky, and you've got another bloke who's been sucked off by, like, loads of Miss World. So it comes down to what the American electorate respect more. Well, listen, Probably this is the thing. you get off by the Miss World. But you get gonna... two for one because you get Hillary, <laughs> who's competent, and then you get Bill for the fun. He's going to yeah, be the first times. husband. Mm. Brilliant. Mm. Look, she's got stay power she's got yeah. she's got strength and she's yeah. got ball more balls than he oh, imagine has. all yeah. the shit though that bill's gonna do it's Hattie's time darling no 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 but listen oh, i think he's still know, got more left in him it's like he's Chris gonna Evans. be embarrassing to, for her chris evans said that he had reformed and he went off into the wilderness for a few uh, years but yeah. as soon as they start giving him work mm. again you know he's become a monster Clinton, as soon as he gets a sniff of the Oval Office again, oh. Old Bell's going to come back. It's a partnership that works, that's dynamite, that partnership. They've proven they've it. They've proven For it. For years, they've exactly. proven it. Exactly, and they're going to bring it. They've... The fact it remains, though, is that we do have, whatever, you know, we've all been firing these criticisms at Donald Trump for a year now. The fact Doing is, well. he has absolutely stormed it, and he's in a two-horse <laughs> race for the White House now. This proves one thing, and that's that democracy is a fucking stupid idea, right? Absolutely true. There's entirely too much democracy. Yeah. You, I'm behind you there. But what I think it really proves is uh, he was yes. up against a bunch of clowns. Mm. I mean, realistically, I don't think he's going to win, but I think it would be amusing to see what would happen if he He did. was eating a taco salad mm. off of a picture of his ex-wife in the nudie tootie. I mean, I'm sorry, this is not a state. This is not statesmanlike. A, he's eating a nacho salad, taco salad. Yeah, that's all right. And that's B, nice. it's, B, it's off a... A plate with his bits. So underneath, -wife all on he it. can see underneath all the avocado He's and taco like and whatever else is a pair of tits. He probably yes. doesn't even this like This is the salad. sort of thing that's your so friend difficult. Corbyn should be doing more of. <laughs> then we might have a bit of respect and say there's a bit of fire in his belly. Come on now. He should have a kebab that's... off of a picture of Diane Abbott. Oh, don't be disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, panel. <laughs> there now follows a message from the Right Honourable Jeremy Corbyn, leader of Her Majesty's Opposition. Hello there. I'm Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the Labour Party. <laughs> That's right. I'm the fucking leader. Get used to it. I backed Sadiq Khan as Labour's mayoral candidate. Next thing I know, he's mouthing off about what a weak leader I am. <laughs> now, <laughs> listen, Sadiq. Don't think I won't have you kneecapped just because you're an ethnic. <laughs> I mean, I may act the woolly liberal, but I'm no Muppet. Zach Goldsmith, on the other hand, lovely fellow. <laughs> Used to play darts with his dad. And we fell out when I turned up at his daughter's wedding in a pair of sandals. <laughs> Cut and threw me out. <laughs> OK, we're now joined by Jermaine Greer, friend of the show. Hello, Jermaine. Hi. Thanks for joining us again. OK, you've been a radical all your life. I'm interested to know, what do you make of the Labour Party's predicament right now? Well, you know, the most important thing for the Labour Party to do right now is to oppose. And what they need is a rhetorician. They need someone who can make a speech that just makes your eyes water. Now, we know that Corbyn can do that. 
But he's, can he? But I've he, never yes, seen him he do, can that. do that. That's what they chose him for. And he's not doing it. He's, he's creeping, he's letting the party apparatchiks tell him what to do. Uh, he's on a hiding to nothing. He'll never be the head of a government, but he is the head of an opposition. And that's what he should take on board and that's what he should do. Even at the, at the cost of being over the top and ridiculous, he should just go for it. Um, there's another big vote looming, of course, the EU referendum. What's your view on Europe? Oh, well, I think it's time we got in. Mm. When, we've never been in. <laughs> yeah. You know, we've been sitting on the fence for so long. We've got a great groove in our behind. And now we're saying, Meep. if you don't do things our way and if you don't agree to the things that we want, then we're going to take the ball. We're going to run away. Mm. Um, and I think that's really sad because the EU is a fantastic project and it, it's worked extremely well, all things considered. And it was very clear to me when Cameron went on that trip uh, to Europe that heads of state really put themselves out to be close to him, to talk to him, to convince him that Britain's presence in the EU is important to the EU. And for us to be behaving in this cock -teasy sort of way, on again, off again, now again, maybe, is not British, it's not handsome, it's awful. Um, we had Anne Widdicombe on the other week, who's very pro-Brexit, and she was fuming about Obama's intervention in the debate as if it was none of his business. What did you make of that? I think it was a warning. I think it was probably quite a useful contribution. I mean, what Obama was saying is he needs the, the bloc that is Europe and he needs it to uh, include Britain because the world is dividing up now into these power blocks and they've got to be more or less evenly balanced. Mm. If we get them totally out of whack, then we could be in a really dangerous situation. Um, on immigration, you're Australian. UKIP want an Australian point-style system. Uh, so tell us, does that work for them? Would it work here? Well, now, the thing about what Australians think their policy is is one thing. They think that they're holding off the hordes that are coming across the seas um, when, in fact, they're being undermined all the time. You catch a cab in Sydney and the person who's driving it will have come to Australia on a scholarship to go to university and was supposed to go home. And they don't go home. They fly in. They don't come in in boats. Yeah. And what we've done to the people in the boats is criminal. Uh, we've got to the point now where people are pouring uh, petrol on themselves and setting themselves alight when UN officials come to Nauru, for example. This is all hideous. It's illegal. Half the people we're holding in offshore uh, camps are, in fact, guaranteed refugees. They've passed the test, mm. but they still can't get into the country. Jermaine, you're pro state in Europe, as you've outlined very eloquently, but you must have been some European countries you didn't want to stay in. And we're going to find out which ones they were now, as we play a game called I'm Jermaine Greer, Get me out of this sexist country. I'm a Jermaine Greer. Get me out of this sexist country. So here is a map of Europe. Now, uh, myself, the rest of us on the show, obviously have a lot of opinions on uh, how they treat women's rights and their attitudes towards sexual politics in each of these countries. But all our assumptions are, of course, based on lazy stereotypes and old-fashioned and informed opinions. So we want you to fill us in. Uh, we're going to take you through some countries and you just rate them on the basis of their attitudes towards women's rights. Um, let's look at France, a country where cheating is not only legal, it's encouraged, as far as I understand it. How's their attitude? France used to be le paradis des femmes, mm. the paradise of women. Uh, women ran salons, women were very visible socially, whereas in... in England, that's not the case. It's the difference between a Catholic country and a Protestant country, maybe. But there's also the Gallic interest, genuine interest in women. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give them, from what you said, because that was an education, I'm going to give them a Richard Madeley, who, of course, is the world's <laughs> least sexist man. So, well done, France. Who knew? I um, thought I was about to say he's the world's least attractive man. Well, that's <laughs> unfair. <laughs> Is it uh, unfair? His, his, opi his opinions, at least, should be very attractive to a woman like you. But anyway, let's talk about Sweden now, because, of course, what we know about sexual politics in Sweden is that ABBA was 50-50, half men, half women, but the men didn't let the women do any writing. So where does that leave us? <laughs> I think the women were too busy dieting to do any writing. All right. Also, the <laughs> women were good-looking and had very long legs, and the yes. men were both very plain, yes. you have to admit. <laughs> they were. 
Yeah. So what do you think? Where does that leave us in terms of their attitude to uh, sexual they've, politics? They've got a big problem with domestic violence. The Is that CLA. Right? And that's connected to alcohol. Right. And to the fact that the winter lasts such a terribly, terribly Well, that's a bit of flimsy excuse for whacking your missus, isn't it? Sorry, <laughs> it's dark and cold outside. What was I supposed to do? Uh, and I'm, I'm depressed. Yeah, yeah, I'm depressed, yeah. Depressed. Nevertheless, we've got to uh, condemn them for that, so we're going to rate them with a dapper laughs. Who is that? He's a man who also got comedy out of uh, domestic abuse. Uh, OK, let's turn to England now. Uh, very interesting <laughs> one. The UK, sorry, I should say. We, of course, did elect a female leader, but she did have a penis. <laughs> anyway, uh, where, where, how do we rate the UK? Well, what are the chances that a woman would get elected again? You know, Mrs Thatcher did a job for the Tories that they couldn't do for themselves. She brought in the working class. She unveiled the essential working class politics of which are right wing. She built it into uh, a new kind of Tory party, which has now kind of disappeared because we're now back with the Etonians. Uh, but they, they also dumped her. They dumped her cruelly. If you look at someone like Tony Blair, he's rolling in money. He's got all kinds of directorships and all kinds of sinecures. Margaret Thatcher had to go on the stump. She had to go and lecture like I used to have to do. Uh, they gave her nothing. They, they abandoned her. And so the thing you remember is her, her eyes full of tears. As she said, it's a funny old world. They cashiered her in the worst way. And that's their innate misogyny. I think England is the most misogynist country in Europe. Wow. I'm going to have to give a Clarkson. That's the best I've got left. <laughs> uh, wow, that is damning. Um, but thank you very much. I've learned a great deal. And you don't have to believe what I say. Thanks, Jermaine. That's all we've got time for tonight. Thanks to my panel, Louisa Zisman, David Mills and Holly Byrne. And, of course, special guest, Jermaine Greer. Good night. <laughs>